The water in these lands is pure. Clean water enriches the soil. From rich soil sprouts new life. Prayer brings water. This land was home to many a god, but they shunned people. Thus the land was only admired with envy from afar. Nature is not merely an inhabitant of space, but one of time. Every forest has history. Some of it may be unintelligible to us, but after all, this world we inhabit does not owe us an explanation. What we owe it, though, is a sincere effort to appreciate and witness the scars of its past, the road that led it to the present. No place is better suited for such an effort than the Shrine Ruins. Located in the Kamura region, this valley sits in an already troubled land. For many years, the threat of the Rampage loomed over this region, a calamitous event in which thousands of monsters stampede towards human settlements, frenzied and bloodlusted. In fact, the region's once bright capital, Old Kamura, was completely destroyed in one such rampage five decades ago. While its few survivors built a new Kamura, Fear governs their lives, as the possibility of another rampage drives them into strategic valleys and fortified bottlenecks. It is this looming threat of annihilation that thickens the air of the shrine ruins. Dense bamboo forests, towered over by large rocky spires crowned with abandoned temples, serene streams that trickle past ruin and wreckage. This water is considered sacred. Its purity is said to be able to heal all ills and grow any crop to perfection. Many such tales envelop this natural sanctuary, tales steeped in the mystery of its past. Once, this land stood as an unassailable vanguard against human expansion, as a mythical creature only referred to as a celestial god shunned any humans who might approach. These waters, this soil, these trees were not ours to exploit. And so, the valley flourished, giving birth to many curious inhabitants. One such inhabitant is a species of bird wyvern almost entirely endemic to the shrine ruins. While they have sometimes been spotted elsewhere in isolation, the Izuchi generally stick to these bamboo forests they call home. Raptorial in build, these slinky wyvern patrol the lower levels of the ruins and congregate around the various bamboo bunches. Their large populations and wide territory define this bird wyvern as a tremendously successful species. Despite the ruins being filled with many potential competitors, the Izuchi live mostly in peace and do not have to fear attacks from larger monsters. This is due to two crucial features of the species. For one, the Izuchi are omnivores. While they certainly prefer to hunt for meat, they are perfectly happy to forage berries and fruits. This takes away some of the pressure many predators succumb to, as food of some kind is always available. Thus, the Izuchi aren't as pressured to take risks in what and who they hunt. And secondly, the species succeeds due to their extremely sophisticated social structure. The female Izuchi organize and control the central nest of the pack, while the males are in charge of hunting and patrolling the territory. As a pack grows and controls an area for long periods of time, knowledge about the local environment, potential dangers, and more is passed on from one individual to its younger peers, creating a wide variety of experience and expertise. The Izuchi's strength is that they don't just act as a pack, they learn and evolve as a pack. Older males that proved themselves especially useful eventually gain the complete trust of the females and are appointed chief guard of the nest. As this duty is carried out successfully and more responsibility falls on his Izuchi, hormonal growth combines with their age to turn them 
into a great Izuchi, an alpha raptor and unquestioned leader of the entire pack. The more pronounced white mane of the great Izuchi may as well be a crown, so complete is the loyalty of its henchmen. While its bulk naturally delineates the great Izuchi as the most powerful fighter in the pack, its true strength lies in its throat. Growing into an alpha also modifies the Izuchi's vocal box into a screamer sack, which allows for loud, complex vocalizations that function as orders to its pack. With this ability, the great Izuchi can coordinate pincer attacks and ambushes in order to overwhelm prey and foe alike. These maneuvers are made deadly by the Izuchi's signature weapon. Their tail blades, curved and sharp like sickles. These keratinous growths become larger and sharper as the Izuchi age, being black in the juveniles and dark blue in adults. By spinning their bodies around, these wyvern can use these blades as lethal rippers, able to cut through most materials given off speed and force. The younger Izuchi tend to use these for smaller assaults, mostly warning cuts intended to manipulate the target's movement. Once they have cornered their prey, the younger Izuchi will make space for the alpha to deliver the killing blow. A great Izuchi's tail at maximum spin can easily fell a tree, and whatever is hiding behind it. And this quality actually denotes the Izuchi's greatest ecological impact. The bamboo in the shrine ruins is special. It never stops growing. Assumed to be a consequence of the land's sacred soil, the bamboo shoots of this region continue towards the heavens until they are cut. While this may sound mystical, it, combined with bamboo's naturally fast growth rate, creates a real logistical nightmare for the area. If they grow too large, a number of fatal consequences may occur. Flying wyvern may find their ancestral flight paths impeded, light may be filtered differently and away from established flora, shoots collapsing under their own weight may cause regular damage. So, a natural limiter to the height of the bamboo was necessary, and the Izuchi fit the bill perfectly. A single swipe from a great Izuchi can cleave a sizable radius of bamboo back down to acceptable levels. And since their tails can easily cut through them, the Izuchi do not bother avoiding collisions with the bamboo as they hunt and fight. Thus, just by living their lives and hunting by their methods, the Izuchi naturally and accidentally become the foresters of the shrine ruins, shearing the surrounding bamboo sporadically and preventing excess growth. Then, without warning, a bolt of lightning resounded through the night. When dawn broke, the gods were gone. Divinity is, ironically, not a reliable entity, and thus, the inhabitants of the ruins have to be ready for sudden, drastic changes. The gods that once ruled this land are said to have suddenly vanished, overnight, leaving the valley unguarded. This marked a shift in the shrine ruins, as they were now subject to the usual ecological factors. New species, natural changes, and of course, humans. There is at least one creature that seems to not have minded any of these changes. While it isn't clear if it already dwelt in the ruins during the gods' reign or migrated into it after their departure, the Arzuros is a common sight in the shrine ruins of today. This fanged beast leisurely promenades across the lower areas of the valley, preferring open areas close to the water. That is because the Arzuros is a veritable glutton. As an omnivore, it can choose between a wide variety of potential food sources. And so, it simply chooses to eat a little bit of everything. fish. Berries, fruit, small animals, carrion, the Arzuros is not picky. It however does prefer fish, which it grabs right out of the water, and honey, which it slurps up from bee nests. The latter is such a favored food item that an Arzuros will instantly ignore everything around it to feast on any honey it may find. 
Despite this food frenzy, the Arzeros is actually surprisingly thoughtful in its foraging. It will actively rotate between hunting spots in order to not disproportionately diminish its future supply. It will even hold back from eating an entire nest's worth of honey to make sure that the bee population can recover again. This lifestyle, as well as its nutritional flexibility, make the Arzeros a fairly relaxed and passive species. However, this does not mean that it can't cause some trouble, especially in encounters with humans. Due to its strong food motivation, Arzeros will actively approach humans that smell like fish or honey. And should they be carrying any of those precious snacks, the Arzeros will leap in and try to grab them. While it will be pacified once in possession of the food, the monster's roughhousing and tossing of the human can cause injuries and invite retaliation. Despite not being particularly aggressive, the Arzeros does possess weapons. While it may look furry, it sports numerous shell groves called braces, which are flexible and yet hard. These braces are especially developed around the front limbs, where they form spikes and the Arzeros' signature long claws. A swipe from these arms can cause devastating damage if it connects, so an Arzeros will swing them around to deter potential attackers. It will also regularly stand up on its hind legs and raise its front limbs into the air, making itself as big as possible as a further intimidation tactic. Should it come to combat, the Arzeros can charge, swipe, and grab any opponents it may find, and thanks to its deceptively heavy weight and dense muscle mass, most of that is fairly damaging to anyone on the receiving end. Equipped with these features, the Arzeros will not allow itself to be bullied, not by humans or other inhabitants of the valley. The people began to gather in this blessed land, erecting many a shrine to venerate the departed gods. As humans returned to the valley in order to erect palaces of worship for the departed gods and their sacred land, encounters with monsters became more frequent. As a result, increasingly more of the bizarre inhabitants of the shrine ruins were documented. It was around this time that the first reports describing a peculiar phenomenon started appearing in the historical record. The texts speak of a parasol hopping about the forest at night, folding and unfolding aggressively at any that get too close. While no genuine walking umbrellas have ever been confirmed in the wild, modern scholars have identified these records as most likely referring to the Acnosom, a bird wyvern that predominantly inhabits the shrine ruins and is generally endemic to the Kamura region. Its distinctive crests and defensive stance can indeed make it look like a giant parasol from afar. The Acnosom are solitary wyvern which patrol around the valley sporadically. They are considered to be highly attuned to environmental changes and will immediately investigate anything out of the ordinary. This behavior likely caused its first encounters with the returning human population, who then got to witness the creature's unique intimidation tactics. The Acnosom produces a special type of tissue on its head and wings, a fleshy growth that is both prehensile and erectable. On its head, this growth takes the shape of two half-circular crests, a small one resembling an eyeball and a massive collar sprouting from the back of its skull. These two crests can be extended and enlarged at will, and the back collar crest can be angled forward, upward, or downward. On the wings, the fleshy growths produce layers and layers of flexible shelling, which can be adjusted to form a protective layer on the outside of the wings. By doing just that, then enveloping its body with its wings, and then finally angling its collar crest downwards at the back to protect the back of its neck, the Acnosom can take a defensive position. In this stance, the fleshy growths protect it from harm, as they are sturdy enough to withstand serious punishment. This is likely what gave birth to the myth of the wandering parasol. This is not where it ends, however. Once the defensive Acnosom has properly scouted out a new situation, it will enter intimidation mode. Its wings will flap open, its collar will expand to its maximum size and stand up high as the bird screeches loudly. This is a very effective and very serious warning. 
because should an opponent not heed it, the Agnesom will put its money where its mouth is. The collar can be folded forwards and be used to bludgeon enemies through headbutts and charges. The larger feathers on the Agnesom wings have extremely sharp edges, and while not comparable to the Izuchi's tail blade, a good slash with its wing can still cause serious cuts and lacerations. As a partial insectivore, the Agnosom also has a very sharp beak and powerful legs that can both cause major damage. But the bird wyvern's true weapon lies in its diet. While the Agnosom heavily favors insects such as Altaroth, it regularly feeds on various herbs as well, specifically fire herbs. As they are broken down during digestion, the fire herbs are stored within the Agnosom's fire sac which can regurgitate a flaming liquid extract when stimulated. Should an Agnosom be in need of a little more oomph, it can thus spew out balls of burning liquid, viscous enough to bounce around and set fire to anything they touch. Not just that, but the rising heat from those flaming balls allows the Agnosom to temporarily hover in place, allowing for a spontaneous airborne assault. Luckily, Incidents involving Agnosom are fairly rare these days. Most people tend to thread carefully and turn back when faced with a 3 meter tall screaming umbrella after all. Graced by abundance, the people lived a bountiful and peaceful life, filling the land with prayers. Either way, Due to increased human activity, many animals living in the Shrine Valley encountered new challenges and opportunities. Humans are not just exploiters and hunters, but targets for all sorts of prank and mischief to some. Especially to one monster. Since ancient times, the Shrine Ruins have been subject to a few mysterious happenings. Fruit stores suddenly vanish, wooden monuments are destroyed overnight, and various poisonous fumes swirling in from the forest. Initially, these were believed to be bad omen, signals from the messengers of the gods. Now, scholars are certain that it was actually just the result of the Shrine Ruins resident troublemaker, the Bishatan. Sometimes called the Tengu Beast, the Bishatan is a feathered fiend that has lived in the valley since ancient times. A curious creature that doesn't shy away from investigating anything and everything. While the females and juveniles live in large colonies with little time for mischief, the male Bishatan is solitary and always up to no good. As another omnivore of the valley, it is always interested in any food it can find, but it much prefers fruit, especially persimmons. A unique feature of this fanged beast is its stomach pouch where it can store and even age any food it comes across. Said food can serve a different purpose, however. Should a Bishatan feel threatened, or maybe just a little goofy, it can reach into its pouch and chuck any fruit it doesn't need or want at its opponent. The Bishatan actually collects various types of fruits for this exact purpose. The poison fruit is rotten and releases a toxic mist, while the flash fruit breaks apart into a dazzling flare. Crucially, however, the Bishatan is not itself immune to any of these effects, so it has to make sure to cover its nose and eyes, respectively, whenever it uses them. Even without specific adaptation to its fruits, the Bishatan still sports numerous features that maximize its ability to create chaos. Its tail tip is modified into an articulate appendage, not dissimilar to a claw. The palm is covered in dozens of tiny trenches that allow the claw to attach to almost any surface securely by ways of the van der Waals phenomenon. Meanwhile, the top of the claw is covered in smooth shelling that, when the claw is curled up, allows it to slip and move across the ground effortlessly. With these two opposite surfaces, the Bishatan can stand on its tail and either affix itself to a surface or slide around it with high speed and precision. In addition to all of this, the Bishatan is one of the very few fang beasts to actually have wings, which stretch from its sides up to its wrists. These allow the beast to glide and hover, but they do not grant true flight. 
These features combine to make the Bishotten an agile and slippery opponent, as it can zip around on tail and wing, attach and hang from any surface, pelt you with fruits of various kinds before swooping in and bludgeoning you with its curled tail tip, an attack strong enough to break rocks. Moons passed, times changed. The people became arrogant and thankless. And as they did so, the land fell into desolation. As time went on, the new human population in the valley began making a larger impact on its environments, causing changes that had wide-reaching consequences for many of its other inhabitants. Simultaneously, as much of the Shrine Valley fell into disrepair, new legends began emerging. Ghostly warriors, born from the wet abyss of the rivers, whose nighttime battles shook the earth itself, come to punish the humans for letting the valley decay. The ghostly bellows that echoed through the watery creeks of the valley long terrified the people, believed to be the voices of rancor, spirits that lamented the decay of the land. However, with current knowledge of the area's ecology, it is curious that these reports seemingly lined up with the breeding season of the Tetranodon. This huge amphibian is another species that has long since lived in the Shrine Ruins, inhabiting any areas with water. The Tetranodon is a semi-aquatic being and as such needs to remain humid at all times. To that end, it possesses a humidifying organ in its head, and it additionally allows algae and seaweeds to grow all over its body, which suck up water and retain it even during long trips across dry land. It is functionally extremely similar to the spongy mane of a royal ludroth. This omnivorous beast will lunge at and devour just about anything it can fit in its mouth, but it has a particular taste for cucumbers small aquatic critters it digs up from the underside of river boulders. Already powerful by itself, the Tetranodon can swallow things it doesn't even wish to eat in order to bloat itself. Water, rocks, dirt, anything goes. At maximum size, the Tetranodon becomes a slow but deadly mass that shakes the earth. And this ability is generally reserved for a very special purpose. Female Tetranodon will, upon reaching sexual maturity, set out to find a very specific kind of location. A waterfall surrounded by basins of various depths and bushels one can easily hide in. Once a suitable site has been found, the female will prepare a nest under the waterfall before hiding in the water or the bushes and emitting its mating call. One after another, Bloated males will begin appearing at the waterfall and engage in the Tetranodon's mating ritual. Violent combat to determine who gets the female. In this bout, the Tetranodon will use all at their disposal. Their stomps will create earthquakes, while their fists weaponize air pressure for long distance attacks. Their forelimbs have modified pads that allow them to hold and carry large objects, like boulders to be flung at the enemy or the enemy to be flung anywhere. And the Tetranodon's strong hind legs facilitate high jumps, which end with the creature crashing down with its full weight, a deadly move for many opponents. In a true pickle, a male Tetranodon can unleash one final weapon. As it gorges itself on anything and everything, the beast swallows large amounts of water that it stores in a dedicated water sack. In a pinch, the Tetranodon can empty that water sack and shoot the water out of its mouth, either as is or as beams pressurized through the creature's nozzle-like beak. This is a risky move, however. The water in its water sack directly contributes to its bloated state, as the sack is in its stomach, and careless use of this ability could result in the beast slimming down and thus weakening itself. In fact, while its mass can seem intimidating, Nothing worries a bloated Tetranodon more than a direct blow to its inflated stomach, as it can easily force it to vomit and slim down. Either way, one male prevails and continues the species, while the other retreats in shame. 
then, one night, a gale swept the land before halting abruptly, as though it were the breath of a divine being. In its wake appeared the gods, thought to have vanished. Terrified, the people fled from their ire. As terror gripped the populace once more, as the land decayed and a vengeful god allegedly returned, humans became increasingly fearful of the shrine ruins. Around these times, monsters began becoming more aggressive as well, and before long, their periodic frenzy was known as the Rampage. No one really knew what caused it, but there was one creature that seemed to be its puppet master. The legends of the Rampage are intertwined with whispers of a malicious spirit that haunts the shrine ruins. A mass of will-o'-wisps, a purple flame created from the wrathful souls of the deceased, a returner that possesses the monsters around it and directs the Rampage. This belief was based on the recorded observation that these ghostly lights were spotted during every single Rampage in the historical record. Then, 50 years ago, during the most devastating rampage yet, the spirit was revealed to actually be a fanged wyvern, the guild later classified as Magna Malo. A grotesque wyvern full of spikes and claws, whose body hums with an eerie screech as if souls were crying out for freedom. It was this beast that doomed old Kamura's fate. Due to this, the legends surrounding Magna Malo became ever fiercer. It was the master of the rampage, the source of all the misery that had befallen Kamura. It was only through research and observation that these myths could be tempered by facts. As more knowledge about the Magna Malo came to light, its control over the rampage was dispelled as a simple misconception. A Magna Malo is covered from head to toe in various armored plates, which can defend the creature from any blow. Only the red-colored parts of the Magna Malo are actually its original skin, and its armor can be arranged and extended through specialized muscles. Be it turning its tail into a tridented spear, extending razor-sharp arm blades for deadlier swipes, or revealing its massive tusks when it's feeding, the Magna Malo's life depends on the strength and versatility of these armored plates and growths. More importantly, its horned crown almost unilaterally dictates mating, as only male Magna Malo with the largest and most elaborate horns will be allowed mating privileges. Thus, this wyvern's life stands and falls with its armored growths. The problem is that these plates grow only once, and once destroyed, never recover. This is especially devastating if the horns are broken as that entirely bans a Magna Malo from ever mating. Therefore, the creature developed a way to prevent such damage. Many legends note a frightening purple glow and a wailing accompanying the Magna Malo, a phenomenon dubbed Hellfire by the populace and officially adopted by the guild. Hellfire is, in fact, not the souls of the damned, but a digestive gas that the Magna Malo can release from the gaps in its armor. Specifically, Hellfire is produced through the digestion of bone marrow and ignited once in contact with air. This is possible due to both the high energy level of bone marrow and the unique traits of the Magna Malo stomach acid. Hellfire has many uses. It enhances the creature's attacks with destructive blasts, it allows for long-range assaults, and it even enables short-range flight through explosive propulsion. But the Hellfire's true power, and its main purpose, is that it can coat the armored plates and horns of the Magna Malo, tempering them through heat and temporarily making them much more durable. In essence, the Hellfire protects the Magna Malo's precious armor and allows the Wyvern to fight at its full power without having to constantly worry about breaking it. This mechanism motivates the Magna Malo's entire behavior. Broken armor means solitude, weakness, and death, and so it desperately seeks to stockpile bone marrow in order to continuously fuel the hellfire. To this end, it hunts way more prey than it actually needs for nutrition alone, which naturally leads it to the rampage. 
an all-you-can-slay buffet of confused, injured, and frenzied monsters. Easy pickings for a top predator such as the Malo. Thus, its consistent appearance alongside the rampage being considered proof of its involvement was a classic case of correlation not equaling causation. The Magnamalo didn't cause the rampage, it simply benefited from it and sought it out. The people begged for clemency, but the deities raged regardless, chasing the mortals away. Time devoured the people's shrines and prayers. But eventually, pure water and rich soil returned to nurture new life. But not all mysteries can be solved like this. While many of the myths that surrounded the shrine ruins have been lifted and resolved to the guild's efforts, many still remain. According to the historical record, the gods returned to the valley and drove out its human population, after which no original records remain. And yet, the gods are nowhere to be found in the ruins of today. While the characteristics described in the relic texts do line up with at least one elder dragon species known to the guild, it is hard to know for sure. What we do know is that forests and valleys like those of the shrine ruins have always been a site for mystique and wonder. While many of its legends were frightening, they filled this land with wonder and otherworldly spirituality, which in turn kept humans away and allowed for free and natural propagation of some truly fascinating creatures. Myths may inherently be ephemeral, but what is real right now is the beauty and creativity of the natural world, as it's found all over the globe, including within the desolate and yet beautiful Shrine Ruins. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a special thank you to all of our patrons, including Carthayer, Fictionape, Cini, Pidi Fuego, Courage, Eric Nelson, Iron Camel, Jameson Tate, Luden Ther, Paracha, Peroskoko, Project Iceman, Wisdom Minari, Makot O2, Mr. Meander, and Geo. Thank you all so much, and a quick reminder that if you want to see these videos a little earlier, we're speaking about a day, maybe two days earlier, you can sign up for the Patreon as well, you will have access to that and the Discord, but no pressure, I just appreciate that you watch the silly shit I produce. Take care, be safe, and I'll see you again, friends. Bye-bye.